I stand before you on this morning not to be long at all. Amen. I know some of y'all seen this big old large bottle of water. Y'all said, is that brother going to preach that hard or that long that he need all that water? I'm going to use that as pose a question to you on today. Subject of my message. It is simply, what are you thirsty for? Come on, look at your neighbor. Say, what are you thirsty for? Let me fast forward it to 2016. I, I have to admit that I am lost. Amen. I was a youth pastor for eight or nine years. I thought I was in the, in the know and I felt good. In 2016, I've been far removed and I'm lost. I'm confused. You have a young person that's in your house, and they'll be on the phone, and they'll have a whole conversation in front of you, and you'll think they're talking about one thing, and they're talking about something inappropriate, and you don't have a clue because the words that, are, that they are using, they're interchangeable. They're using words now like fleek, which I guess means you fresh. And if I had to break it down all the way a little bit more, I guess that means you okay. They're using words like people are throwing shade. And I was totally lost on that. I said, the sun ain't even out. And this cold is all get out. I said, how's somebody throwing shade? But they had to let me know that means somebody's doing something and, and it ain't that cool. I, 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 I'm lost. I'm lost. I'm lost. I need, a, I, need a, I, need a, I need to get with the program. But there was one particular word, amen that I overheard some young people, and they wasn't here, so, so parents, don't be twisting your, your kid's ear and, and, and pinching them. It wasn't here. I, I overheard this one particular word, and, and, and the word was thirsty. See, I'm going to tie all this in. If y'all waiting, I'm going to tie it all in. The word was thirsty, and, 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 and the conversation went a little something like this. It said, these boys and girls out here, they be acting all thirsty. Well, I understand what thirsty means. That means that your throat is dry, amen, that, that you need a little water, you need some Kool-Aid, amen. I'm, I'm thinking I'm hip, and, and, and my daughter's looking at me like, mm, mm Nah, Dad, you way off. So I had, to, I, had to, I had to get with her. She's 16, amen, almost 17. And I said, baby, can you help me out? What does thirsty mean? My daughter advised me that, when an individual is considered thirsty, they become so consumed and they come, become so obsessed with a person that it is apparent to everyone around them that they are desperate for that person's time or attention. So I ask you again on today as I go a little bit further in this message, what are you thirsty for? As we visit this familiar passage in John, the fourth chapter, Jesus meets a woman at the well, and Jesus says, can you give me a drink? In verse 9, after this request is made by Jesus, the woman becomes a little bit confused. She's confused because she's, she's familiar with the protocol as it relates to the Jews and Samaritans. She, it, she, she knows that they're not supposed to be interacting. She understands that the Jews look down on the Samaritans because of intermarrying uh, between other nations. And so the Jews look at the Samaritans kind of like they were half-breeds. So she's, she's a little confused. Why, why is Jesus talking to me? Matter of fact, she probably wanted to act like that conversation was never even happening. But as the conversation continues in verse 10... What we find out is Jesus shares with her, this is all the way, we, we're going to get through a little bit this, but this was all the way in the beginning. In verse 10, Jesus shares with her the simplicity of salvation. Jesus says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Salvation. Simply is asking God to save you and receiving salvation in return. Let me back it up with a scripture. Acts 2 and 21, it says, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So right out the gate, because that's how Jesus is, he says, I'm, I'm going to kind of let you know where I'm going, and we can cut to the chase. 
You can, you can receive this living water right now. But, but she was confused. As the passage continues, we find out in verses 13 through 15 why Jesus had to proceed. It was simply because he knew that the woman had a thirst in her heart that the water from the well couldn't, couldn't quench. So Jesus, what he had to do, he had to give her a water quality control lesson. He explains to her in verse 13, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I will give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. What Jesus was basically conveying to the, the young woman, he said, you can continue to rely on this water at the well. He said, you can continue to come here. We can meet every single day. We can meet at the same time. We can meet at the same place. But you do understand that this water that you're receiving from this well is only temporary. That you're going to have to come back the next day and you're going to have to still pour water up to feed your, to give to your family and, and to, to give to your lifestyle. This water is only temporary. Ask yourself this question. How many people you know who appear to be thirsty? They're looking for fulfillment in the wrong place. It might be a thirst for enjoyment. It might be a thirst for excitement. It might be a thirst for acceptance. It might be a thirst for accolades. They might be thirsty for, for a brand new house. They might be thirsty for a new car. They might be thirsty for more money. They're thirsty. And, and they go around and, and, and even some of the times they obtain these things, but, but lo and behold, after after time passes and these things begin to get old, they're still thirsty. We got a lot of us in here that have purchased new cars. Let me see everybody that's purchased a new car before in your life. Amen. Okay. I'm just making sure. Tell me if I'm wrong when you purchase that new car. Amen. You might stand outside and look at it for two or three hours. Just, just looking for a speck of dust. Got your magnifying glass out. Tires, your rims, all that stuff looks real nice. Y'all talk to me about three years later after you're sick and tired of paying them car payments. Don't wash it. French fries, they, they petrified up under your seat. You, you not only have to say excuse me when people walk in your house because it ain't clean, but you got to say excuse me when they get in your car. Oh, man, y'all don't want me to preach on this morning. I'm trying to make a point that when it's new and it's fresh, amen, it, it's more acceptable, it's more appealing to the eyes. But over time, amen. Because it's, 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 it's tangible. Over time, what happens is, is that it begins to lose its value. You begin thirsting for a new car. Because the one that you brought three or four years ago no longer satisfies your thirst. Complete these sentences for me and don't answer them out loud, amen. Just answer them to yourself. My life would be fine just as long as I have Blank. You fill it in. Life would not be worth living if I lost what? Blank. You just answer it yourself. Whatever that, that answer is, could it be that that's the well that you're drinking from? Hopefully the answer was Jesus, but if it was not Jesus, could it be that's the well that you're drawing from? In the fourth chapter of John, this passage of scriptures is so essential uh, because Jesus wants to remind us that he has living water. And this living water that he has brings eternal satisfaction. 
This living water that, that Jesus is talking about, it quenches our spiritual thirst. And he wants to let us know that it's not found in things. It's only found in him. Matthew 5 and 6 backs this up. It says, Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. John 7 and 37 says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures has said, streams of living water will flow from within. So after hearing this introduction, the woman at the well, she comes to terms that the only thing that could quench her thirst, truly quench her thirst, was the water that Jesus was talking about, the living water, where you receive salvation and receive uh, freedom from sin and bondage and condemnation. She knew that she needed to make a change. So this is what the woman said in verse 15. She replied, she says, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming to the well and to draw. And like Jesus, I love Jesus. How many of y'all love Jesus? I just love Jesus. And, and Jesus, to me, sometimes the things that he does are so comical. We are so serious a lot of times. And this is where I get my joy and my laughter because you, I, I think Jesus could have, could have, he could have packed a house because Jesus would do some stuff that would just be, just would be funny. Uh, you know, he, he put mud on your eyes, amen, and, and, and then next thing you know, you sin, amen. He, he would get water and turn it in. So Jesus would do some stuff sometimes that I believe that, that if we was there, we'd probably have to sit back and chuckle and say, oh, that Jesus is bad. Oh, he's bad. This is one of the, these, this is one of the occasions. After Jesus witnesses to this woman and, and tells her that, that he has some living water for her and he brings her up to speed and reminds her that, that this natural water won't quench her thirst and gets her all excited and gets her ready and prepared to receive this water, this is what Jesus does. Jesus said, first, in 16, I needed you to do something. He said, before you can get this water, he said, I need you to go and call your husband. Mm. See, in effort to awaken her spiritual need, Jesus has to get in her business. He has to expose her sin. It says in verse 18 that, that, that this woman had five failed marriages. I, I know some of y'all, y'all saying I can't get one or two, amen. How'd she get five? She had five of them. God bless her. God bless the, the five that, I'm not even going to mess with that. Because either they was messed up or she was messed up. I ain't even going to go there. And he said, not only do you have five failed marriages, but on top of that, you're with somebody right now and it ain't your husband. I need to expose your sin before we move forward. There's an important spiritual principle at work here. Without conviction of sin, there can be no conversion. Without conviction of sin, there can be no conversion. Let me help you out. John 6 and 44 says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last days. Until a sinner knows he's lost, he will never desire to be found. 